And we're admitting folks here. Hello, good evening. I'm Carolina Wheat, curator at Art Fair, um, and um, on many hats, uh, uh, among a lot of other curatorial gigs. Um, so excited tonight for our Thursday series to introduce Sophie Khan, an artist. Hi, hi, Sophie. Um, an artist that I discovered uh, just by walking around Chelsea, I think, uh, you know, five or so years ago, where your work was displayed in, um, it was it CR? Yeah, C24. That was 2019, January 2019. Yeah. It feels like forever ago, Sophie. It does. It does feel like five years to me. <laughs> it wasn't five. It was not five years. One year, but a giant 2020 in between. Yeah. But when I first discovered your work, uh, you know, I, I might have seen it around um, in, in images, but to see it in real life. And then to see you join Art Fair, I was a hog in heaven. I was so excited. So thank you for being part of the community. Oh yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited to talk tonight. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, we have you here now. You're in your apartment right now, correct? You're not in your studio. Yeah, so my studio was at the Elizabeth Foundation in Times Square. Um, and I really, you know, I'm on pause there. I can go back when I'm ready, but um, I don't have childcare. And um, I'm, my, you know, my daughter's high risk. I'm not taking the subway. So right now, a lot of my stuff's in storage and I'm working at home in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. So working at home, I mean, since the lockdown hit and you know you couldn't get to your studio and it's unfortunate yeah. because there's such great spaces and such a cool location I, know, I miss it's it community. i miss it i miss efa yeah the zoom happy hours were not a replacement like <laughs> i'm gonna get back i mean you know like i said they've, they've just kind of paused me and they've said i can come back when i can which is nice of them that really is that's wonderful i'm certainly yeah. understanding i always uh, extremely reputable organization. It's so yeah. cool. But well, you you jump back to but what if anything, you know, when you had to move your practice mm. from, you know, your standard studio to home, like what or if anything, what changed about your work or just I don't know, maybe if you could tell us a little um creative problem solving to work through you know how you practice. Yeah, yeah and I mean it's been a journey honestly it, I feel like it's actually taken me about this a much time to wrap my mind around kind of what happened you know and we were also just chatting uh, earlier about how I moved to Australia with my family in search of uh, you know, less cases, then we got un stuck under the world strictest lockdown in Melbourne very swiftly and moved back. And uh, it's been, I'm remote schooling my kindergartner. It's been a lot. <laughs> like, you know, and that's a joke, like remote kindergarten's a joke. Um, so, but you know, I, I've got to a point now where I'm carving out time. And it's tough because my practice became so much about my connection with my models and collaborating with models and dancers and performers. And they really brought so much of the energy of the work. So I've had to return to, sometimes I feel like this kind of like Victorian lady housewife doing like little watercolors at night, you know, in front of the fire, like, <laughs> um, but I'm fortunate I have a digital practice. I have a big archive of digital imagery. And so, you know, I'm going back to that and I'm working in more flat media. I'm doing bar reliefs now. Um, I'm doing, you know, much more inkjet and painting. So like things that I can fit into this life and, you know, the understanding is like, it's not forever. Oh, I just, uh, Caroline. So I, 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 uh, it's nice that you're able to go back to some of the archival, you know, part of your practices, digitizing these forms and creating, mm -hmm. um, you know, that three-dimensional space from the scans and then, you know, the sculpture just becomes yeah. so alive and yet really exemplifies this kind of, um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm pushing intention here, but I know, uh, you know, a lot of the, the feminist kind of jive that you take Absolutely. towards a lot of these female figures. But the one thing is the the idea of um, decay, almost, you know, this 
really eloquent lines and 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 forms in itself and often you know the the works feel as if the it's a corpse <laughs> Whether... yeah. and that's you know something like I, i'm going to talk about this in my screen share too but you know photography has this long history of talking about the still image as a corpse or a zombie you know there's this eeriness of copying yourself making yourself into this doppelganger and then the image is like dead you know the image is not a representation of the person um and also i came out of photography history and i did study feminist self-portraiture and people looking at the female identified body and actually really thinking about the damage that representation kind of wrought on the body you know that the act of representing the body was in itself there was a kind of violence to that capturing that um and so i think yeah the like the damage in these figures and the fragmentation and decaying the figures kind of came out of that history as well yeah, I mean, there's just a further the metaphor in relationship to the pixelization of the forms from their initial scan, and then, you know, turning it back around and having it be PC or, uh, you know, as you kind of fragment it, as you use those words, and, and I like to think of that um, maybe cliche to say meta idea between the, the the human form to the digitization and the and the pixelization and then back again to this unique yeah. decomposing type of but often in such lively positions almost it feels um that <laughs> that became important too and they've got a lot livelier over the years because for me it became so much more you know the like the digitization damages it so much and kind of depersonalizes you so much that to have a level of humanity to it and a level of relatability where you could come to them and they are kind of an expressive body um that became really really important so they went from these really kind of stately still white death mask things to something that was a lot more active and engaged so yeah you'll see that evolve through the through the images too tonight yeah and you know before we get to uh the presentation because i think you've got some really nice uh video clips of you working as well as some still shots um and some really nice exhibition shots so we can see more of the work uh yet you know you just address this slightly with the the impact that the lockdown must have made for your work because of the incorporation of other humans mm. and I you know I'm just curious I know you had the um residency at, at the Pioneer Works and you know kind of had developed a community there but how do you find your models and what are you looking for so yeah with Pioneer Works I was specifically reaching out to Butoh performers and that's something I'll um, that's like my my show that I'm going to talk about tonight that's going to open at SBA next year focused on. But actually, I was right in the middle of another project that's so new I don't have any visuals. And I reached out on social media, I actually put out a call on social media. Um, I said anybody who identifies as female and feels that they've been through a physical transformation. And the stories were just so amazing and beautiful. And I had, you know, one of my former clients, she'd had a preventative mastectomy, found out she was a BRCA gene carrier. She had, this is her idea, she had me 3D scan her breasts and then post-surgery she 3D printed this and bronze them and performed with them on stage. And so she modeled for me. I had my friend who was seven months pregnant. Um, I was working with a model undergoing gender confirmation surgery. I was working with people who'd gone through, you know, just surgery, mm -hmm. trauma and eating disorders and like the pieces are coming out of the conversation and that got interrupted like I just can't do that now so that's going to be 2022 that series I've had to go back like I'm bored of self-portraiture now but I think I've got to go back to it like what I have you know <laughs> <laughs> but my kids won't sit still they won't let me scan them <laughs> <laughs> uh well I've created, you know the creative solution is most obvious one at this point but you know it's um it it is a nice you know moment to really reassess and as you were talking about self-portraiture but it, it it's it's that time for self-reflection and reinvention you know to say that your form is the only inspiration what if um you know you can reinterpret what your form is 
perhaps with like, you know, Cindy Sherman it, or I just like putting like weirdo ideas out there. Just, you know. I'm learning sculpting software actually, so I can actually move my bodies around really much. I can like pose them and I've never known how to do that before. So that's really fun. I'm hoping something good will come out of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, uh, let's start looking at a, a, your presentation, you know, uh, share the screen and show us a little bit more about your process and things. If anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll share them with Sophie. Okay, you can see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's end. Um, all right, well, yeah. Um, I'm gonna skip my little bio and intro because I think we've, we've covered all of that already. Um, so this device is the foundation of, uh, of all my practice. Um, this is a, a 3D laser scanner and it's a very, very precisely engineered piece of equipment, but it is not designed to capture the human body. So when you move and when you breathe, it generates these multiple um, overlapping forms. And I very deliberately and carefully uh, misuse my scanner. So that generates the, the fragmented shapes that you're seeing in the work. And you can just see a little bit. It's it's very kind of intimate and transactional. You have to be very close to the model. They have to hold still, like they're sitting for a Victorian studio portrait, and they uh, their eyes have to be closed because otherwise it's going to damage the eye. Oh, so wow. that, that that gives a whole lot of eerie overtones uh, that I really kind of like to highlight in the work. Um, and this is just one more little clip from um, my residency at Pioneer Works. Mm. It was a real feat for him to hold still. He's uh, he's struggling here. <laughs> it's quite a precarious position. Yeah, the balancing yeah. on the ball of his toe and the palm of his finger. Sometimes they're just like, oh, I can't do it anymore. Um, all right. So and yeah, I actually started working with it at RMIT University in Australia in 2003, and they were 3D scanning uh, Gaudi's maquettes to finished the construction of the, the famously unfinished Sagrada Familia Cathedral. Mm -hmm. so I started working with the scanner kind of after hours and scanning my own face. Um, and I was making these sculptural death masks and really trying to get at, yeah, this idea that we were talking about, the photograph as a zombie, as a corpse. Um, they looked just like a death mask to me when, when I made these images. So for a really long time, I actually couldn't materialize them. You know, this was back in like 03, 04. 3D printing was not a thing unless you were in industry or in, you know, or you were a real hacker. And I've always been open about the fact that I'm not. Um, so I was making prints, these very kind of photographic Victorian spirit photography, these large, large scale prints, but all rendered from body scans. And then I really, I wanted to make objects though. And so it wasn't until you know about 10 years later honestly eight nine ten years later i started working with shapeways and for the first time the software was easy and materials were cheap and so i was able to 3d print and make sculpture out of the form and mm -hmm. so i kind of have not looked back from that point and sophie can you uh tell us a little bit about uh the materials that you're using to 3d print i mean some it almost looks like clay or uh, plaster yeah. plastic yeah. It, they are plaster. I can stop my share just real quick and I'll show you one of the objects that I've got. Yeah. I've got, I've got that one. Um, hang on, sorry. Um, okay, so let me just pick her up. Oh, where did I put it down? Um, actually, you know what? I put that one down somewhere funny. I've got a different one though. <laughs> um, so they're, they're plastic and then a lot of them are actually hand, hand painted. Uh, I should be wearing gloves here, kind of hand finished and sanded. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, that color one is plaster. It's, um, oh, I found it. <laughs> My shelf are mess. Here she is. So I'm trying not to drop this. I've dropped one of them and smashed it. And it's actually got a photograph of her face that's wrapped around it as a texture. And that's like done, that's native to the process. So that's actually like embedded in the 3D print itself. But much more, more recently, I've been hand painting them because I prefer that. Um, all right, let me just jump back to my share because I've got to 
bunch of bunch of images I'm going to try and click through um, and I can just also like let that run uh while we're while we're chatting oh yeah and they seem you know the 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 plaster ones are particular they just you know just um a wonderful bronze the plaster ones they feel so fragile and i mean and the the bronze certainly sits with such strength um yeah they're um there you can't really make this stuff in any other way like foundries i was trying to get it cast in other materials and, and they've always sent it back in a box they're like no <laughs> so like getting that delicacy became really important but they're actually plastic and i had a whole show in beijing that i like smuggled into china in my suitcase oh yeah. <laughs> good work it's a lot i mean it's like a mouse you know it's like a lot stronger than it looks so at least it's cheap to to create which is nice yeah. um, all right so moving on to some of the larger sculpture because that's always and that's actually always been my goal like i want to make big public scale work um and so I, a lot of my efforts are kind of funneled right now towards trying to fundraise for that and try to find venues for that um i am obsessed with this book it's called saving graces and um it's images of women in european cemeteries both uh real memorials and an allegorical and there was this weird weird nexus between death and sex that was kind of going on in these these figures mm -hmm. um where it's okay if she's an allegory of mourning it's okay for her to be like completely hypersexual in a religious cemetery but you know the real women are like very you know very um uh what's the word respectable <laughs> um so i'm looking a lot at funereal sculpture um i also draw a lot on my background my experience with chronic illness and so this imagery of the sleeping woman the kind of fainting woman comes up a lot um and then i'm calling you know like the uncanny valley i feel like everybody has seen this at this point but the idea that as you duplicate the human body um you get closer to verisimilitude but like paradoxically it's more repulsive to us so a perfect copy of a human is actually kind of horrifying to us you know like like this which we don't make movies like that anymore because they're just too upsetting <laughs> it, 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 that is so true would you mind going back to that diagram so i admittedly oh, yeah, yeah, Kenny, I've never yeah. seen this uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's the corpse and the zombie like down the bottom and so that's where you know the cemetery imagery is kind of coming in as well mm. There's always a level of kitsch that I'm walking in my work. Like this is this is my all-time favorite image that I always use in my lectures. This is the um, Star Trek, the like the matter transporter accident, where somebody goes into the transporter and they get beamed, but then they come back wrong and they like they're hideously malformed and they die in agony. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think about this all the time. It's like this, you know, and my new series is really much more explicitly about that, about the idea of like beaming the body into the digital. And then rematerializing it, but it does not translate. So it's kind of a critique of all these technologies too that we're using to represent. Um, so this, um, that all kind of filtered in. This was my first kind of major solo show that I had at SEIC just um, at the time that I graduated from my MFA. And this show was called Artifact. And so these are actually all scans of myself, and these are all life sites. So this was the first time I could really make large sculpture it is printed in a number of sections it's, it is kind of tricky there um the, is that is that plaster or acrylic this is uh nylon nylon powder so laser scented nylon is the process mm. um, and very much like a play on kind of classical fragmentation but the damage is really digital and then these kind of works too are looking at the the digital that it's almost like this digital fungus that infects her face and the breaks down this is my software trying to resolve this and failing into kind of one mm -hmm. form um and then more recently so yeah there's two series i'll i'll kind of um i've got my eye on the time so i'll do a little briefer introduction to this one but this was the show that you saw at c24 so this series was called prodromes and it was again looking at this question of representation as a violent in kind of an inherently violent act and these images are from the Salpetriere Asylum um, in 19th century Paris, where many, many thousands of women 
Um, and some men actually, interestingly, post World War I, men that we would now say had PTSD at the time, they called them male hysterics. Um, they were kind of incarcerated and they were made to perform on command. And so photography was used incredibly extensively. And the idea is that you're, you know, capturing madness, which is, you know, insane for want of a better word. Like um, photography, it, these were not documents. These were kind of these weird, like violent, coercive performances. Um, so I got hold of the manuals that they used. This was supposedly the stages of the attack. And then I had performers reenact them. Um, and some of them are me, some of them are dancers that I worked with in Chicago. And I um, had them, you know, restage these poses and I scanned them. And again, there's like the, the scanner misreads the bodies too. And then these were made ultimately as these forms with this branching. These are actually the 3D print supports, the software generates these. But it became the perfect kind of metaphor in the images because it was about instability and then this question of like the digital body coming into the world as sculpture and how do you, it's actually going to fall over, you know, how do you show it really practically, how do you put it together. This was kind of my solution, but it, it all made sense, it all kind of hung together eventually, like having the body be on this weird organic, um, but also kind of industrial support. So yeah, this was the piece in the in the window in C24 that I think you would have seen. This one was it. Stunning. And the combination of materials too, I think uh, it helps. I mean, they're very, they're very much entwined, both the, the organic shape and, and the scan of the figure, as well as the structural trees, roots that um, you've propped the, the the shards or the fragments of the figure um, mm -hmm. and then the two different colors. Can you remind me what what is the frame made out of? Is that wood or was it like chipboard? Or... Oh, so I'm gonna show you, I've got a few process pieces of this one. It's actually all printed in one go. Um, and it's just my like decorative faux finish. I wanted one to look like wood and one to look like concrete. So this is how it came out of the box. Mm -hmm. And uh, my poor fabricator dealing with the world's worst like 3D jigsaw puzzle here. And mm -hmm. then it was hand painted um, and then kind of aged. So there's really, it's all layers of patina and sanding and dirtying it up, like trying to stuff it up. Um, and that's become really important to my practice. Rather than having this perfect thing that comes off the machine, you know, having something that comes into the world that is then handled and treated as sculpture became mm -hmm. really, uh, really rewarding for me. Um, so that's that piece at Bitforms and that's a work by Susan Silas in the background, who's another um, super interesting artist working with female body and um, digital representation. And then these are some of the smaller pieces at C24. So these are really more like this, this scale. Mm. Oh, and the whole series is called Machines for Suffering because apparently Pablo Picasso told his mistress Dora Ma that a woman is a machine for suffering. Oh, lovely. So. Speaking of professors, what, um, who, who are you working with at SAIC? Oh, Claudia Hart was my, mm -hmm. you know, no. Claudia, yeah, 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 yeah. She's like, a really good friend. Um, and she's done actually so much for creating a context around digital work within the contemporary art world that's work that's really thoughtful and critical and smart um, that is engaging technology, but it's not like an ad for technology, um, which is not always the case I find within the new media world. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I just love that about the School of Art Institute of Chicago where you really have a lot of autonomy agency and you just like pick who you want to work with and you just kind of go to your, you have to be pretty self-motivated. But yeah, that was great for me. You know, I did not want to be sitting in class. I had, I had a like two-year-old. I could not be in class 50 hours a week. I was just like, I, I was older. I was in my thirties and I just wanted to kind of go to the studio and, and make good work. But um, it was such a, such a fantastic community. Um, I also had David Getze as my advisor who writes about like Rodin and the male body and desire and he was fantastic as well. So it was a really, really good, good combo, my senior advisors. Yeah, David Getze is definitely 
given me a lot of food for thought over the years, especially the queer body and the queer, mm -hmm. the queerness in our history. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was great too. So it was a good contrast of, uh, of people. Um, how are we for time? Sorry, I'm, I'm on full screen. You're, you're brilliant. I mean, you've got 30 minutes in, you got 30 minutes. Can I go? Oh, no, okay. I've been, I've been going too fast, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me, I can slow down a bit because the, the series that I want to talk about um, is the, um, this very long delayed series from, from Pioneer Works. So um, I've always, I've always been a really intuitive artist in terms of my research practice. And I've always sort of just followed little threads without really knowing where they're going to lead and trusting that it'll work out in the end. Um, so I did a tech residency at Pioneer Works at the start of 2019. And um, there, it was a really great residency because you actually, they, the tech residency, they don't give you studio space. Um, but my feeling was as a tech artist, that was never really something that I needed. Um, it was, you know, much more access to facilities. Um, partnership with New Lab and then kind of community connections. Yeah. So I decided I was in this real research phase and I was really hypnotized and kind of fascinated by uh, Boutot performance. Um, the end work really didn't end up being very much about it. And I'm also, you know, incredibly conscious that it's a form of performance art that's coming from a culture that is not my own and it's not something that I want to kind of speak for or about. Um, but having said that, um, Bouteau, for people who are not familiar with it, the, the very basic kind of Bouteau 101 idea is that it's um, a form of dance uh, that originated in post-war Japan. One theory being, you know, it came out of the trauma of Hiroshima um, and the body is really rendered in extremis and it's incredibly, you know, incredibly gestural. A lot of the Bouteau training is incredibly intense and you some of the you know body where the farm that i think mintanaka ran the training would be that you would just fall all day long and on rocks and kind of end up bruised and you'd fast on nothing but milk or nothing for days and days and so it's really intense taking the body to extreme um but also the performers were really intensely vulnerable um which i love because it's the total antithesis of classical ballet where you have this beautiful youthful like um, you know, body that's perfected and that transcends physicality. And some of the Boutot performances I've seen was the exact opposite. It really was about suffering. Um, and the, the aging body really kind of clearly, you could read the kind of failure in it. Um, and this idea of the fall was one that I kept kind of coming back to. So I spent a lot of time um, reading and like watching, watching documentaries and watching film. And the culmination of my residency was this, it wasn't really a performance. I guess it was a work in process showing where I brought in several performers, um, some Japanese, some German, uh, one American, because um, it is a form that's kind of spread throughout the world at this point. And I instructed them to fall. And that's kind of, again, like one of the, in Buto workshops, there's this idea of improvisation and of just planting a seed for the performers where you just give them this one suggestion and then they run with it so this was really the models came up with so much it was so improvised and they came up with so much of the gesture and the shape and the um like the structure of the the images which was really exciting for me and it was I did not know what it was going to turn into actually this this night of scanning and that yielded data that has eventually turned into the show um, this was a Zumi OA. She was a really, really wonderful um, Buto and, and generally performance artist based in New York. And she modeled for me a number of times. So she comes up in like a lot of these. Mm -hmm. And then this is one of the final pieces that has come out of that. So I called it The Divers. Um, and it's kind of the idea is. Again, I guess these these things that we this concept that we've talked about before about the, the body being projected into digital space, but almost equating making that kind of quasi-religious, if that makes sense. It's like the soul, the avatar, it leaves the body, it goes into this weird other realm. Um, and then there are these really ghostly ethereal figures. And this is very large, this print. This is about 85 inches. It's almost like a oh, wow. Uh, yeah. 
Um, and then what I'm working on at the moment is turning these into bar reliefs. So kind of a hybrid between the print and the sculpture. They're um, like a shallow, um, they're, they're sort of meant to eventually look like this, like a cameo glass. And, um, but also inspired by super cheesy, uh, really, really, really cheesy, you know, tombstones and <laughs> um, And that show was meant to open on March the 11th, so we all know. <laughs> no. yeah, that was going to be my opening and and it's all still there it's all still at SBA it's like collecting dust but it's fine it's granite it's not going anywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> um January I think it's it's gonna open open up in January this is one of the little pieces so this is a um a clear 3d print that's mounted on a granite backing and it's it's not large it's the uh, almost like kind of columbarium size, you know, like a little urn, something you might put your ashes in, right? more that scale. So, yeah. Well, you know, just to jump back to the, the, the spiritual within the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the kind of the breathing out of life from the form and you're breathing back into the life uh, through the sculpture. There is, there is a, a tangible kind of energy in the works. Um, and, you know, I'm no witch or, you know, maybe a little mystic, but I, I do find them to be rather haunting at times. And this sentiments that we have in our own bodies, you know, uh, often, I think it was just yesterday I read that, that sentence doesn't exactly live in where we thought was our brain. It lives throughout our entire body and our neuron, um, and our neuro, neural yeah. and, you yeah. know, and everywhere. So there is an actual moment. I think it was Mary Roach. I read this uh, book called Stiff. I don't know. Oh, you the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, such a fast, so, so good. And that part where, you know, 100 years ago they did the experiment the experiment where the body was on a scale at the moment of death Ooh, and they weigh it like what is the soul way yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. so that that sentiment or that soul within the body it's just it, you know whether it's a, a breath out or whatever to to be able to like kind of think about the work like that um it just it makes me um just very pleased to to think of the because they they do have an aerial feeling to them because they're so floaty um the sculptures themselves in that way mm. yeah um i think i was thinking so much about again like really quite cheesy sci-fi you know about um the idea of uploading your consciousness to the internet i think there is this sense and obviously that's amplified so much now you know, where you send yourself out into the ether. And it's, again, it's a very like flawed representation of us that, that people are seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then also using the kind of that, the memorial language and that quite kitsch, the language of the tombstone. I guess I always had the sense that the artwork was kind of a memorial for the living. Um, there is an essay by Tom McCarthy and it's called Transmission and the Individual Remix and I talk about it just all the time. Like probably anybody who's seen me do a talk is going to be like, oh my gosh, Tom McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, <laughs> but he, is, he has this thing where he talks about, you know, the archive, how digital archives, like our social media archives being our, our tombs, that the, the you're like your Instagram feed, I think he wrote this probably a bit before the age of Instagram, but, um, you know, on your Facebook status and all of this, like you're amassing all this data and that becomes, I think about the kind of digital death, you know, when you see somebody on Facebook who has unfortunately passed away, then there's that archive that's left behind, you know, that, mm -hmm. um, that we are generating all the time. Um, that is like not us, you know, it goes beyond the body. And so I guess, I really am kind of looking at these figures as, um, yeah, the, you know, the kind of projection, just this question of the avatar, like what, instead of, you know, the, the kind of 20th century question was, is the photograph, the document, is that a piece of data? 
Um, and for me, maybe the question now is like our avatars, our digital avatars, is that a document? And, you know, the, the remembrance too. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about memorialization pages on Facebook forever, but I'm just going to say one little thing. They really are, um, they, they really, it was a magnificent idea, I think I will start with. Whomever decided to do Facebook memorial pages really kept me inside the Facebook world. You know, having um, had a, a handful of folks in my life that have died tragically, suddenly, or expected, expectedly, who did keep up Facebook pages. Um, you know, it is it is nice, those memorializations. And, and you know, further, the... The, the memories that you are able to go back to in that ether that you speak of. Uh, I had a Gen Z someone uh, once upon a time tell me, and this was maybe just like a year ago, they were like, well, all that Facebook stuff you're putting up there, all that data you're putting up there, I mean, pretty soon they're just, you know, the deep fake is going to happen. I love talking about deep fake, but, you know, pretty soon when you die, you won't be dead because we'll be able to create, uh, you know, these apparitions of you, the virtual reality. Be dead, uh, reunited boyfriend yeah yeah like your hologram because yeah. it's, it's like a total uh black mirror episode really it is it uh, is <laughs> but, uh, but you know the the future is of technology is moving so quickly is outdating itself every six months even faster at this point you know in this in this anthropocene and um uh, i i do value this the, the, the difference between what we self-generate online and that which has been generated for us. Uh, who knows the, the, the backgrounds of um, whether you, you know, data personalization like PeopleSoft and, uh, you know, biodata, uh, all of our biodata records of, of health mm -hmm. records, like that's, that's being generated for us. And then what we generate for ourselves, you know, there, there, there might be, I was privacy issues, but certainly different kind of coming together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I it's this. I feel like this work is still up in the air in terms of exactly where I come down in thinking in thinking about all of that. Um, I think, in general, it just for me, it kind of comes back to this sense of failure. Um, I think all my work really has been about failure. Um, because, you know, you can put so much effort into creating these representations of bodies and same as taking a photograph, it really, in the end, I feel like it tells you almost nothing. Um, and there's, that's kind of sad. And then that's really also very liberating as well, because then the end result, the art object is something totally transformed. Mm -hmm. Um, in the same way that like, uh, you know, I can look at like a, you know, a photograph of my child from a year ago and it doesn't bring back to me. And, you know, it's like, it, there's still like an accessible or, you know, like an image of my, my late father and it brings back a certain memory, but then the photograph kind of cements the memory. And then sometimes you'll give yourself, you know, you'll be convinced that you remember something because you see a photo of it. Um, and it begins to supplant our memory too, you know. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think that even 3D, and 3D is kind of sold as this perfect, perfect capture technology. And what wars are fought on the basis of 3D data, like LiDAR data going over a route, you know. But it's so malleable and it's so... Um, it's just so kind of crummy, like 3D scanning sucks. <laughs> I was at a conference four or five years ago at like Princeton, um, I think maybe longer. Um, I did a, a residency at Empath at RPI and then I was like working with the LiDAR scanners that they had in their computer science department and went to this 3D scanning conference. And I was there with like all these experts in the field and they're all sitting around a table being like, it sucks, it's terrible. <laughs> like give us 20 years and it might get good um so I don't know it feels like almost like the dawn of cinema as well I don't know it's like a yeah mm -hmm. 
Well, it makes so much sense that you're referencing um, some of your inspirations, you know, the the grave pieces, the, the, the uh, I don't know, sarcophaguses of sorts, likely. Um, and the inspiration of the Japanese theater, bu bu Buko? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had not really heard of that extreme uh, endurance performance. I had not really understood it. And, and some of those images, they feel so tenuous. Uh, truly, like you have, someone has tetanus, you know? It's like oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a bit of time. I can pull up like the folder. Um, I have a bit more documentation from that, um, the Pioneer Works uh, performance that I did, if you like. Um, let me that, would be, that would be pretty interesting. I, I, I bring it up because I'm, I'm curious because your, your works, I, I suppose to me, don't feel as tenuous as some of those Bucco um, images that you shared or the, the, they, they feel just a little bit more at peace. Yeah, maybe, maybe it, 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 there's a real kind of like, here, oh, hang on. Oh, actually, that's not what I want to do. Sorry, let me share my, my, oh, I know why. Sorry, because I have two monitors. Let me, let me share this one, maybe. Cool. Sorry, I'm like slightly, slightly improvising. No worries. We're just, you know, casual. Let me try Oh, no, I'm sorry. It wants to like go into my PowerPoint. Um, well, do you have more of your PowerPoint to share, or did we get did we get through it all? Uh, we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, here, well, you know, what? I'll I'll just uh, I can go back to um, that that imagery, and then um, let me go back to the imagery of the the Pioneer Works show, and I can talk a little bit more about the actual kind of process, the editing. Mm -hmm. um, one second. Okay. Uh, this one that you have a number 39, can can we look at that really quickly? I, I don't know if we really addressed either of those works. It's just like the uh, infrastructure of how you to drawing. It's like just like an illustrator file. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So these are, um, I actually render them in Autodesk Maya. And that, so this is the, so I can, you know, I can talk a little more about some of the technical stuff as well about how it's done. Um, so Maya is also the software that's used in industry for um, 3D animation. So a lot of the kind of, you know, kids, uh, I don't know, I'm like blanking on the name. Not not Disney, but you know, all that all that kind of cartoony, a lot of those movies are Dreamworks, Pixar. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I loved it. I, I kind of fell in love with it really early on because it allows you to kind of be a virtual photographer in a virtual space. And that's actually what drew me into 3D in the first place. Um, like bridging from photography when I, I studied photography and graduated and got bored with photography. And um you can place virtual cameras and you can work, take a virtual photograph of a building, but then you can take a photograph up from the sky or you can turn that building into glass or you can kind of transmute the materials of reality in a really, a way that you can't when you're physically embodied um, with a camera standing on the street. And it also kind of came out of necessity because I got really sick right, right afterwards, right, like right after I got finished undergrad. Um, and my gear was really heavy. I was doing this kind of architectural stuff of going out on the street, like schlepping my big medium format camera in a tripod. I kind of couldn't do it. So I, you know, started doing these virtual photos instead. Um, again, as like an extension of the physical body into the digital. Um, and this, these are rendered, these are both rendered in Autodesk Maya and they're close-ups. I, I guess I sort of sort of thought of them as like a blueprint, you know, an architectural blueprint for the body in the sculpture. And they are, um, they show every triangle that, that it's made from. Um, and I might, I have a few, I wonder if I have the prints around. Um, 
Well, these prints are for sale, right? I mean, I think they are. Oh, these are, yeah, these ones are on up there. Yeah. yeah. 5,000 or something. I mean, they're just yeah. exquisite. What, what are their sizes? I forgot. Um, so I think they're mostly set, they're 17 by 22, the ones that I have on up there. Okay. Um, but then the ones at C24, they're also exhibited at a really large scale of, of 48 by 60 inches. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But um, again, it was, I guess, something that I've also come back to a lot in my practice is this question of, um, putting you know juxtaposing the body with something that it wasn't really designed for so this is very much this sense of like an architectural blueprint um mm -hmm. and you would expect to see a building rendered in this language or a kind of technical diagram and then the question is well why is why do you have a blueprint for a woman you know why would you be building the body of, of a person in this way um so yeah they're very they're they're ink jets and they're super detailed and in some of them i actually will paint over uh that was you know it was like a corollary to that hand painting process on the sculpture um was the process of actually putting color over the ink jet and um oh i can pull out i've got my folder of ink jets that i can show too actually uh yeah. so if i want to let me see i can turn off my chair and show you some of those because it's it doesn't photograph that well either, sadly. Um, okay, let me grab my inkjet. Thank you. So like a fair number of these are digital. They're pretty small and they're, they're inkjet prints that have had color hand applied. So, and that's, I find that I'm not a painter. I always kind of wanted to be, and I don't have the hands on skill to do it. But there's something that was really kind of satisfying for me about just going over it and kind of moving the ink about around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's, it's a little difficult to see, but some of them have been kind of sanded or like scuffed or, you know, damaged in that same way. Um, But yeah, I mean, that, that also became a process that was something that I could do without a studio, you know. It's, it's yeah, this one feels has that tenuousness in it, that the, 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 all of the prints. And these prints are taken from the Pioneer Works. Uh, the, these ones are a bit older, actually. Um, yeah, these are these are some of the like outtakes from the, the Hysteria series, but yeah, I think, you know, more and more I'm trying to um, just make the work that I can make uh, kind of at home. And I think that's like something that a lot of people are, are dealing with. Um, I heard it, like I heard an interview with, uh, I think it was Jerry Saltz on a podcast actually, so she, you know, maybe a couple months into lockdown. And um, I really, this this at this particular thing he was talking about, I, I really, really liked because he was kind of saying like, you know, for 5,000 years, most art has been made in the home um, and like around the kitchen table with like the kids underfoot and the dogs underfoot. And so much of human creativity has not taken place in this weird rarefied studio. It's, uh, it's been made in the midst of life with, with more utility. And so that made me feel much better you know, about the change that my practice has gone through in these past six months, having the studio be inaccessible, having just like that space and quiet actually focus be really inaccessible. Mm -hmm. This theme that's come up for a lot of artists that I know is that how can you make work that's mindless? <laughs> mm. How can you, you know, because you're getting distracted all day long, like what can you do? And I have a friend who's um, doing embroidery. So she's like, well, I can I can watch my kids Zoom calls and I can also put this embroidery over these these digital the jacquard weavings that I have because it's something that I can kind of just continue to do. So, yeah, yeah. I think and when you were mentioning that, what can I do that's mindless and uh, you don't need to start some great, you know, conversation in regards craft versus fine art and all these, you know, the, the, the terms that throw around, just throw them out, whatever the case. Yeah, I feel bad. I didn't mean to say that craft was mindless at all. You did. You did. 
you did it at all but i like i i this is the first thing i thought of was no idle hands this is my grandmother which used to tell me all the time like you know she hated the television she thought it was she would waste a generation you know she was alive today to see the the zoomification of school and everything you know a different story but people might expect for idle hands right it's the no idle hands and i think a lot of folks right now really experience that because they can't be off their phones and so there's like sitting and and having something to do and producing something and making something is kind of I, I like thinking of that as craft as you're just, you're just making, it's like kind of a rep, rep, repetition. You know, you, you do have to think a little bit obviously, but you're able to meditate and it's really a uh, part of your practice. It's just, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, when I'm, I'm curating, I'm always really looking for craftsmanship, craft womanship uh, and concepts. So mm -hmm. these two things coupled, um, again, not the pejorative craft. I mean, I, value ceramics and textiles and yeah yeah but no i agree i agree and i'm very actually not thrilled about the kind of the de-skilling movement that's happening you know like the glamorization of de-skilled labor mm. um, because i have so much like, massive respect for really traditional skills you know casting and glass and um, yeah. all of that ceramics and it, it's very frustrating to me to see an artist make something that is totally deliberately de-skilled I, I just i can't you know um i think my work is really good. um but yeah there you know but i think also like all of us like unless we're lucky enough to have an army of studio assistants where we just come up with an idea and then delegate it and then you come back when it's done and you sign up to take the check i think there's your work there's this five percent where you're really coming up with the idea and that's the kind of intense thought and decision making and then actually my favorite part is when the decision's been made and you're just executing it and in my work that's very long it's really lengthy um and it's really slow and I sometimes feel like I've had just the success that I've had with the work because nobody else would put up with how like annoying it is <laughs> and how laborious my work the workflow is with the scan and then repairing the file and then the printing and then the working on the piece and then you know like so many steps but the, it is liberating too it is but like so much of that you've made your choice and then you're just doing that very calming mindless quote unquote activity yeah i mean in your work as you've just shared you know, it does it takes a lot of energy. It feels really laborious. Obviously, you enjoy doing it. So laborious may not be the the right term to use. It, you know, it, it's oh, no, it yeah. <laughs> you're diligent and um, and focused. And you know, there's always that question like, well, how long did this take you, or how long does that take you? But the um, works feel that um, they just <laughs> this this is a blunt question. They uh, they feel really expensive. <laughs> because there's so much time and they feel thought and considered and they just I mean when I say expensive yeah you know price points yeah, no, but it's yeah time time too and time but funny in a way I mean um it's yeah it and I date Sophie I'm thinking like you know thirty five thousand dollars for machines for suffering um seems adequate to me in the market and where you're at and like all that stuff it's a beautiful piece. It's really, it's, it's, it's an iconic piece too for New York, for you here. Um, and it's just so gorgeous. And I'm just wondering, you put a lot of it resources into your work, like that scanning machine alone, you know, this um, all 3D printing. I mean, that's the, the well, I, started, I used to run a small business doing the scanning. That's how I paid the loan. So I, I used to scan for artists. I've got a lot of stories about that. Mm -hmm. um I could like I have another hour full of stories my favorite one was like the dude who called me up and said it's like okay I've got a joint that Willie Nelson himself rolled in 1966 and I want to 3d scan it and I want to 3d print it and cast it in gold and I was like you have called the right person I can do that for you <laughs> and I even called him back I'm like I want to make the net Willie Nelson joint no <laughs> yeah yeah it's I I'm I'm 
it's constantly like a battle because you, as a digital artist, you do you want to be able to make work that you can rapidly iterate? You don't want to get bogged down when you have an idea and it takes two years and a lot of money to get to the other end. Um, so that's why I stopped working in bronze and I 3D print in plastic. That is a lot cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bronze just made me crazy. Definitely. And where, where, where is there even a foundry where are you, you're sourcing outside of New York? Is no, Long Island City. Oh, yeah. yeah, they print it in Queens. Okay. Um, a lot of local industry for 3D and it's, it's cheaper than, than you might think actually. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, I was asking about the bronze. Oh, the bronze. Yeah, that was Chicago. Yeah. But I, yeah, I can't afford to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you do like any Q and A real quick? I feel like we're coming up on seven. Yeah, we five more minutes. I I, I I ask folks and anyone still here to pop your questions in the chat, and uh, we can we can look at those. Uh, answer anything you may be wondering about for Sophie's work. Um, <laughs> I'm also like super happy if people want to reach out later and send email and I'm, I love doing studio visits on Zoom. It's been a real highlight for me, just like chatting with other artists. It's just kept me using my brain and feeling like a grown up. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I really encourage anybody to reach out later if they've got any questions at all. That's great. Thank you so much for being available like that. You know, and um, as usual, this conversation is recorded and anything you may have missed uh you can always catch on the youtube channel in a few days once it gets recorded um thank you michelle good to see you. <laughs> thank you yeah. it was really great it's really wonderful to be you know in your in your space with your work um do you do you have work still in chicago at all or do, do, do you any collectors in chicago or no, 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 not really. Um, uh, yeah, I used to, uh, I was showing with a gallery there a few years ago, but um, not, not anymore, no. I do, um, there's the SVA show, which I think they've just pushed back to January. So okay. there, and that will actually now be at the Pfizer building in Brooklyn. And that will be um, these the pieces that I showed towards the end, the, the granite reliefs and some of those prints. So yeah. I will send uh, details on that when I have a date. It's yeah. nine months delayed, so I'm very happy that it's finally going ahead. Yeah, definitely, um, superb. Yeah, and and you're doing group shows. You're working around it. Do you have gallery representation in the city, in New York? No, 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 not at the moment. But you showed at Bitform since you 24 and there's just like, th those were mostly group shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You've got some great um, galleries that, and, and organizations that have really supported and um, displayed your work. So that's, that's uh, you're already in the right direction. Yeah, those are fun to see. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you so much. That was a really great conversation. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm really excited to have this time to dig deep into your practice, learn a little bit more, and I hope everyone else had a good time too. And until next Thursday, thank uh, you. Stay strong. Stay safe. Bye bye. bye, -bye.